they go, yeah, you're wrong, you're wrong, I hate you, you're wrong, you're going to hell. Okay, that's what they've been doing for 500 years. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I want you to think of a seed now that goes into the ground. Okay? If they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Now the uh, the Arminians say, see, you're going to lose your salvation. But it, notice that the word salvation is not here. But then the Calvinists say, well, it says if they shall fall away, but you really can't. That's not there. That's not what that means. And so both groups are taking these verses and using it and trying to skew it in a certain way and by saying what it doesn't say to justify their position. And I don't see that there. Let's keep reading. It says, if they shall fall away. And I, I'm just going to apply King James Bible principles here. Fall away? What does that sound like to you? Second Thessalonians 2. The falling away. If they shall fall away, to them uh, they crucify. They, it is it is impossible to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Now, now we're not done here. He says four in verse seven. He's continuing the thought by illustrating what the garden again. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. The earth, by the way, the tares, the thorns, and the good seed, they're in the same earth. And when it rains, it waters the tares, and it waters the good seed at the exact same time. Verse 8, but, he, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is it to be burned. You see, see my point here? This is why he's saying what he's saying in verses 4, 5, and 6. He's talking about those thorns that everybody has that have to be. Now, let, let me go to 2 Corinthians 12. For I end up saying something that I really don't mean and saying something unscriptural. Let's apply then this terminology. God told Adam, uh, you're going to plant your seed? That's fine. I'll bless it. But that ground, you're going to constantly have to keep those thorns out of that garden, Adam, if you want to eat, if you want to live, if you want to survive. God has hinged our livelihood and our life upon our ability to keep food in our body. And there's work to be done. Paul. Paul had a thorn. And if there is anybody, if there is any one man that I know for a fact is in heaven right now, it's the Apostle Paul. But Paul had a thorn. And so do you. you know, do you know why I have a thorn? And I got a great big mean nasty one. Okay? And every now and then, God will allow the devil to take that thorn and go... And I'll go... And I hate it. I, I absolutely hate the things I have to deal with in my life. And you don't know about them. Okay? I do. God does. Lisa does. You don't know about them. And this is why when Paul mentioned his thorn, it was unidentified. I don't know what yours are. I know you got them. I know for a fact you do. And so... When Paul was writing about this in First Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians 12, he said, "Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations." Now, everybody, that's I hope you listen. You all got a King James Bible. Did you know that there's an abundance of revelations in this book, and you have them. You have them. And can I tell you something? That the King James only crowd, to me, are the most arrogant, cocky, conceited human beings on the face of the entire earth. And I'm one of them. Because you know what we do? We take the measuring stick that God has given us to, to measure out and work out our salvation, and we hold it up to everybody. See, you're not saved. You're all going to go to hell, and I'm not. See, that's what we do. We are arrogant. We are cocky. We are conceited. We are full of pride. We are full of everything. So you know what God does? And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. There was given to him. 
God allowed Satan to sow tares in his life, thorns. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. When people, and we've got visitors uh, here that came down from Michigan, uh, and just bless my heart. People like to meet me. They want to see me. They want to. They want to look in my eye. They want to see what kind of person I am. And I'm always. They. Say, they're just going. Oh, we just love you, Pastor Mike. And I. Man, I like that. But I'm going to tell you to your face. You're looking at probably the worst human being you've ever encountered in your life. That's me. I know I'm not because Paul is. Paul said he was. He was the chief. And I like that because I'm just a little bit less than that now. I feels better about myself. I can't, I can't be exalted. I cannot, I cannot be exalted. I, it, it won't, God won't let it happen because I have a thorn and so do you. And for this thing, I besought the Lord how many times? Thrice. And God, I want to tell you something. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And see, that matches because when, in Genesis chapter 3, when sin came in, what did God curse the earth with? Thorns. What did Jesus bear on his head when he took it to the cross? Our thorns. Thrice. He prayed to God thrice. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And uh, the people out there that don't like me, they're going to say, see, he's using Illuminati signals. And for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And I'm going to, I'm going to, because you have called me and you've told me, Pastor Mike, and you called me crying, Pastor Mike, I have begged God to take this away from me. Did you know that God knew you were serious? And yet the devil's trying, or other people are trying to tell you, you didn't really mean it. You didn't really have faith. You didn't really, really have faith. You didn't really have that. Can I tell you that these people who, who are trying to fill your head that you can live in total absolute victory in this life and never have a problem, a disease, a care, a sin anymore, did you know that they're not telling you their dark, their dark dirty little secrets because it doesn't match their doctrine? That their life is so full of sin or disease or everything else, but they want, see, they want you to believe it because they want you to be the test dummy for them to see if it's going to work. He said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. And you know what infirmities are? It's not just physical maladies. It is sin. The Bible, see, the King James Bible teaches you it is sin. The priest in, in the book of Hebrews, we just covered this. The priest in the book of Hebrews, the, Paul said they had infirmity. You know what else? They had sin. When they went to offer a sacrifice for you, because they had infirmities, they had to go and offer a sacrifice for themselves first. Because not even the priests were right. Most, uh, so I will, I, will, I will glory, I will take pleasure in front. Not that he's going, see, I can stand and do whatever I want to. That's not Paul, and you know that. And reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am then am I strong. And God is going if God is not strong in your weakness, he's not much of a God. Now one of two things is going to happen with you, my friend. And to the friend who wrote in because of the lust that you said you have no control over whatsoever. And you know what? I believe you. I believe you. I've I've dealt with people before just like you, and I believe you. You don't. You don't have any control over this. The devil sowed this in your life at such a young age that it's hardwired into your brain mechanism. Now, over time, things get better. But what I'm telling you, and you know why? Because you go to work. You go to work. You get your hoe out, and you get your plow out, and you start cutting some weeds down, bud. You start cutting some thorns down to keep them from choking out the Word of God in your life. But if you've ever got down on your face, I mean bawling your eyes out, saying, God, I don't want to live another day like this. God, I hate it. Will you take it from me? God's going to do one of two things. And one of the things that God's not going to do is say, No! You didn't ask me right. You don't have enough faith. You don't do that. That's not God. God's either going to take it from you, or he's going to give you grace. It's God's call.
It's God's call. I have three minutes to read your emails. Okay? And I appreciate you forbearing with me. Uh, Luann says, Howdy, Pastor Mike. Can't wait for your teaching today. Lots of repenting going on here due to your Sunday service. Thank, thanks. And bless. You know what? Pride is one of those thorns, bud. I'm telling you. Well, pr the thorns are given because of our pride. And I'm telling you, if you have to deal with lust or you have to deal with some other thing in your life, thank God you don't deal with, uh, you don't deal with pride. Okay? Uh, Grover writes, my security is in Christ, and it doesn't get any more eternal than that. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly. Well, let me, let me finish reading here. Um, Hebrews 10 uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I see, I believe that. Predestination has to do with, uh, with, uh, with what those who have believed in Jesus are to become and what they are to inherit. It never means that, that some have been predestinated to be saved and others cannot be saved, because they, and I agree with that one too. The beginning of our confidence and the end, completion of our confidence in Hebrews 3.14 uh, Jesus, the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. I believe in all of those. I believe in every one of those. I believe exactly the scripture that you gave me, Grover, and I appreciate it. Joe, Pastor Mike, I got involved with Bethel Church by first purchasing a DVD on UFOs from Prophecy in the News. I looked up who made it, and the rest is history. Joe, I appreciate that. Andrea um, is asking me, how is casting lots different from divination? God seems to have allowed lot casting. Well, he did. It, it, casting lots is not divination. Divination is relying upon the gods to give you an answer. These lots, they, when, they, when they threw the, whatever these lots were, when they threw these out, they were relying upon God to make this choice for them. Eric, uh, bah, 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 bah. I need to forward that, so I'm going to do that right now. Okay, hang on. That is... Somebody sent it to the wrong email address, and I'm going to get rid of it. All right, now, uh, let's see here. Thomas says, the parable of the sown seed in 1 John 2, 1 John 3, 1 John 5, these are biblical guides for evidence of a true believer versus a false conversion. Amen. David Ferguson um, says, Proverbs 24, 15, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place, for a just man follows seven times. And I'll tell you this. You ain't been good and saved until you've had a crumbling, okay? The just man falls seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. The difference is in the last, and I'm going to tell you something. Here's what I believe, and you can put this anywhere in your little escout, you know, your, your rapture theories. I believe there's going to come a time when the just are going to be standing while everybody else is falling. That's, I mean, that's what I believe. I appreciate that. Tim says, I thought I would add Proverbs 15.10 to the discussion. Everybody look up Proverbs 15.10. Angel, Pastor Mike, is it safe to say since we're all predestined that as a human race as a whole, God definitely predestined destined us all to be worshipers, and because Lucifer fell, have we now replaced his... No, I, no, I, I think that's confusing uh, the issue if I understand. I may not be understanding your, your question right, Angel, so forgive me if I'm not. Um, but... You, God did not predestine everybody to be saved, and then Satan falls and said, "Well, I got I got to change this now." He knew God. God even created Satan, knowing what he was going to do. He was Satan was going to be the agent of choice. Okay, uh, Steve. Uh, hi, Pastor Mike. John chapter three is a comfort for me. I just believe what God says, and I rest in that. And I want to encourage you to rest. Okay, and work out your salvation. Ephesians, uh, this is from Thomas, Ephesians 8.10 is not often spoken verse because verses 8 and 9 get all the quoting, but verse 10 is a key part of the believer's walk, and I, I don't really have time to look at that. So um, anyway, Mark says, hey, Pastor Mike, could you explain just what it means by, by we will know them by their fruit? What exactly is the fruit that we are looking for? Christ. Christ is the fruit. That's clear in the scriptures. Also, Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, long time. All nine of those things. And by the way, nine is the number for fruit bearing. Okay? So study that. Uh, Edwin. How you doing, Edwin? I appreciate you staying up so late, bud. It's Edwin. I have a question. Once saved, will our attitudes and behavior...